There is a state which beheads and even crucifies its citizens, where those who question its authority are lashed and locked up for years. A state where women lack many basic rights, patrolled by religious police, where children are indoctrinated. But this is not the Islamic State. This is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. A close ally which buys billions of pounds worth of British arms. Whose security forces we equip and train, even though they're in conflict with many of their own people. Whose oil we buy, and whose royals get the red carpet treatment. We have a relationship with Saudi Arabia because we receive from them important intelligence and security information that keep us safe. Working with a team of Saudi undercover cameramen, what is? this film sets out to penetrate one of the world's most secretive and repressive states. The women, they're in prison. They just fear freedom. Because of American and European support to the Saudi monarchy, our people have suffered. And we will uncover how Saudi money and ideology has helped drive terrorism around the world. I think there's a very real threat that the ideology that comes from there is posing to us. Morally, we need to make a stand. I think that the, the chickens are coming home to roost on this one. In January 2015, the Union Jack was flown at half-mast in Westminster, a very special mark of respect for a close ally. The Saudi ruler, King Abdullah, had died. Many world leaders came to the capital city, Riyadh, to pay tribute. In the same month, in another Saudi city, a young blogger was whipped in public. Raif Badawi was convicted of insulting Islam after he spoke out about his government and religion. He wrote, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. For comments like this, Badawi, a father of three young children, was sentenced to 10 years in prison and 1,000 lashes. We don't approve of what Saudi Arabia does. We don't like what they do, but they are a necessary evil in combating other regimes. And of course, ultimately, they have a lot of oil. No country is the perfect ally, perfect partner. Uh, without any reservations whatsoever. Um, so, you know, welcome to the, to the real world. Welcome to the Premier League. Yasser is part of an underground network of activists in Saudi Arabia. It's one of the most secretive countries in the world. No journalist can operate freely, and you can't even get in as a tourist. So Yas has come to Istanbul at great risk to collect an undercover camera. Over the next six months, he will be filming secretly inside Saudi Arabia. If caught, he'll be imprisoned. <laughs> كيف احنا عايشين في اضطهاد وفي ظلم وفي استعباد 
الزم علی امی آسیم سوال با اسحاق ناس و لکن کن Two days later, Yasser is flying back into Riyadh to begin filming undercover. In Saudi Arabia, the king is all-powerful. Since he came to the throne in 2015, King Salman's face looms large over the streets. Saudi Arabia is the home of Islam's holiest sites and the world's largest oil exporter. Its state oil company is worth an estimated seven trillion pounds. The royal family and their inner circle are worth billions. Yasser films an avenue of palaces. The external face of Saudi Arabia is ostentatious wealth and luxury shopping malls. But the global crash in oil prices has hit the Saudi economy hard. Despite spending billions on social welfare, it's been estimated up to a quarter of the population live in poverty. This is how millions of Saudis live, a reality rarely seen by the world, because you can't film openly here. Yasser is in Saudi's second city, Jeddah. He shows us how women often end up begging on the streets. <laughs> It's estimated only one in five Saudi women of working age have jobs. And without a man's support, many end up on the street. Yasser and his friend head down to the beach to play their loot. But before they even get there, they run into the religious police on patrol. <laughs> In Saudi Arabia, playing music in public is forbidden by the religious police. After Yasser and his friends have been there for less than five minutes, the police return. This was the last shot recorded before Yasser's loot and hidden camera were smashed. For Yasser and his friends, the religious police are a constant menace. Their official title is the Committee for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice. They patrol the streets and shopping malls, enforcing strict Islamic laws. Activists like Yasser have been filming and sharing clips to expose what they say is their constant harassment. <laughs> They force women to cover themselves and drive people out of cafes to go and pray. Their strict form of Sunni Islam is known as Wahhabism. 
It is the religion on which Saudi Arabia was founded. Here, the religious police are smashing bottles, thought to be alcohol. The majority of Saudis are thought to support the state Wahhabi ideology. Filming secretly in a mosque, Yasser records this preacher spreading hatred of other religions. The state Wahhabi ideology is taught to Saudi children from an early age. Yasser films a 14-year-old Saudi boy showing him the books they use at his school. Books made in Saudi Arabia, but exported to the world. The textbook doesn't just attack other religions. It portrays the Shia Muslim minority at home as the enemy. The Saudi education system uh, has been intended as an insurance policy, as a security measure uh, to protect the ruling family and to mislead the millions of students into hatred of other religions, other cultures, uh, and into the worship of the Saudi ruling family. Saudi Arabia is said to have made some progress reforming its textbooks, removing the worst examples of prejudice. But these books are still found in mosques and schools around the world, everywhere from Britain to areas of Syria controlled by ISIS. No wonder thousands of Saudis joined ISIS and, and other uh, terror group, because they were trained in Saudi schools. From the foundation of Saudi Arabia, the support of the religious establishment has been central to the royal family's grip on power. The regime uses traditional Islamic punishments. Executions are often carried out publicly with one sword blow to the neck. The headless bodies are sometimes then displayed publicly. According to human rights groups, King Salman has asserted his rule by stepping up the rate of executions to its highest level for 20 years. In 2015, Saudi Arabia executed 157 people. This Burmese woman was convicted of killing her stepdaughter. This was filmed by a policeman. He was later arrested after posting it online. The Saudi government claims that only the most serious criminals are executed, and punishments are carried out in line with Sharia law. They say trials are fair, though human rights groups disagree. In Saudi Arabia, criticizing the government, criticizing religious people are considered as acts of terror. And people are reporting on each other, targeting their fellow citizens. 
So everyone becomes, you know, more religious than ever. Everybody becomes more pro-government than ever. So we're going into a fascist society. The Saudi government says the anti-terror law strikes a balance between prevention of crimes and protection of human rights, according to Islamic law. One activist's story, more than any other, encapsulates Saudi suppression of free speech. موقع الليبرالي السعودي هو أثار حفيظة المتشددين بصفة عامة في السعودية لأنه كان يفضح ممارسات. This is Raif Badawi speaking before his eventual arrest in 2012. <laughs> For most of his sentence, Rafe has been held in one of Saudi Arabia's most notorious prisons, Bremen. Saudi Arabia shows outsiders state-of-the-art prisons, but people rarely see the reality. Since Rafe was imprisoned, Yasser's network has managed to smuggle camera phones into Bremen. What they found was chaos and lawlessness and prisoners injecting themselves. Here, a prisoner is abused by his fellow inmates. The British government had approved a £6 million contract to train Saudis on how to run its prisons. Amid the international outcry about cases like Rafe Badawi's, it decided to cancel the deal, saying it was focusing its resources on domestic priorities. Rafe Badawi has received no more lashes since the first 50, but his sentence of 10 years still stands. Thousands of miles away, his wife Ensaf and three children have received asylum after escaping Saudi Arabia. They haven't seen their father for four years. When does he think he will see his dad again? But I don't think he will see him again. Ten-year-old Dudi and his sisters only get very rare phone calls with their father from prison. Their mother, Ensaf, works tirelessly to keep up the family's morale and to raise pressure for his release. Ensaf's campaigning and international pressure 
mean that Rafe's case is up for review in the Saudi courts. والله بصراحة أنا دائما عندي أمل قبل السنة الجاية إن شاء الله على نويل هذا يكون رايف معانا ومن زمان بس لحد الآن لسه ما جاني ولا أي خبر كويس من السعودية In part two, we go into Saudi Arabia undercover ourselves and come face to face with the Saudi state. Watch this. Our undercover cameraman, Yasser, has been filming for us at great risk. He and his network are trying to reveal the other side of our close ally. Saudi Arabia doesn't allow tourists, and they don't allow journalists to operate without minders. So we're flying into Riyadh as businessmen after setting up a fake company. We're taking secret cameras to record our trip. When we get to passport control, there's a bad moment. The border guard looks directly at our hidden camera. Now we're in Saudi Arabia, all filming we do is forbidden. Our cover story is that we're here for a business conference. On the way, we visit one of Saudi Arabia's most notorious landmarks, known as Chop Chop Square. It's the scene of many of Saudi Arabia's public punishments, and there's a heavy police presence. It has drainage for the blood from the executions. Two Westerners in the middle of Chop Chop Square inevitably raise suspicion. We're going to a cyber security conference representing CyberSafe UK, a company we've set up for this trip. We've been placed right next to the Ministry of Interior, the very people who arrest activists like Rafe Badawi. And we're approached by two senior police officers. Good morning, sir. Hello, good morning. Sam. Good morning. Aziz, how are you? Hello. How are you? Good to meet you. Sam, it's nice to meet you. It's a cyber safe UK. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're, um, we're a cyber insurance company. Is it a threat also for Saudi businesses? Yes. yes. This man is head of cyber security for the Saudi police. He's keen to talk about his connections to Britain and America. It's a very good experience, honestly, with the Phoenix Police Academy. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So a lot of senior Saudi police will go to America. For yes, yes. And also I had three training courses in the UK. Tough. Yeah. British police officers. Oh my God. <laughs> The British government has been reluctant to make public details about its contract to train the Saudi police. But now we are hearing about it from two officers who've been through the training. And was that the British government or was it private? And do you think College of Police? College of Police. And Brighton. Brighton. Coventry. 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 Uh, <laughs> and do you know what, what we need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did they send a lot of people to England? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What we are, what we have. We have contract with the Ministry of Ministry of Interior and the government. I think the embassy here and uh, um, contract because the two ministers and they do long term training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a close relationship. Yeah, close. Yeah. The British government has since confirmed to us they have provided more than 300 Saudi officers with training since December 2012. Despite some reforms in education, employment and politics in recent years, 
women still don't have the same legal rights as adult men. Women can't drive and struggle to perform many simple tasks, such as going to the doctors without a male guardian. In some cases of abuse, the authorities do act, but if a woman is the victim and tries to report it, the police may tell her she needs a male relative to file a complaint. This is a tribal society, and it's been kept this way. <laughs> Violence is a symptom of the position of women in a society because it reflects uh, how people view the roles of women. The philosophy of the government is to keep the control of the man or the power of the father, basically. So violence is used as a disciplinary way or a controlling way. But some women in Saudi Arabia are starting to fight back. One woman has become the figurehead for the new women's rights movement. It's to meet her that we've come to Saudi. Lujain Hathloul is Saudi Arabia's most prominent women's activist a constant thorn in the side of the regime. She uploaded videos of herself driving as part of a campaign to change the ban against it. Moments after this was filmed, Lujain was arrested trying to enter Saudi Arabia. She was imprisoned for 73 days without trial. Eventually, she was released, but she is banned from traveling, and she says she still has terrorism charges against her. Despite the risk, she is still happy to meet us. She may be under surveillance, so we have to meet her in a secret location. I've been threatened since the beginning. My car was broken. I almost got beaten up just because of the campaign. People wrote me letters on Facebook and uh, sent me all sorts of weapon pictures saying that um, if I continue, I would be murdered or my family harmed. Lujain's campaign sparked a debate inside Saudi Arabia. To some women, she became a hero. To the more conservative elements, a hate figure. I try to represent their rights. Some of them don't believe that it's their own rights. They refuse it, they're rejected. But I believe that they're imprisoned in their own uh, old raising, their old mindset, or they just fear freedom. Although banned from activism, Lujain hasn't stopped campaigning. She's registering as a candidate in the 2015 municipal elections the first in which Saudi women can participate. It's scary, I'm not saying it's not scary, but, but I'm continuing. I am not stopping, I'm stepping, shaking while stepping, yes, but I'm not giving up. we'd managed to meet a Saudi activist without being detected by the security forces. But when we get back to the hotel, there's a shock. The fake company website we've set up has been hacked. It's pretty dark, I think we get out. Yeah. We don't know who's testing our cover story, but we're forced to leave early and head straight to the airport. We hope that there's no ban on our travel ban on our passports. If we're discovered, we know we'll be arrested. We'd got out. But Yasser is still filming inside. One of his network is driving to a region that's witnessed serious unrest and the first signs of potential cracks in Saudi rule. The east of Saudi Arabia is where most of the Shia Muslim minority live. He's come to meet the family of a boy who has been condemned to death aged just 17. 
Ali Nimr's punishment marked the beginning of what activists say is a dangerous new phase for the Saudi regime. Ali Nimr, Arabi, شعب آخر من شباب العرب يحلم بالحرية يحلم بالعزة بالكرامة. In 2011, Ali Nimr was a schoolboy who joined in street protests inspired by the Arab Spring. Young Shia men hit the streets in unprecedented numbers in a country where protests are illegal. As the days passed, the confrontations with the security forces became more intense. The Saudi police reacted to the protesters with bullets. Scenes like this have raised questions about Britain's contract to train Saudi police. Protests sprung up in other parts of the country. And activists like our cameraman Yasser sense weakness in the regime for the first time. Eventually, after tens of protesters were killed and many more arrested, the regime succeeded in putting down the uprising. Ali recorded his anger at the police's reaction in this confrontation outside a police station. Soon after this was recorded, Ali was arrested. He was charged with numerous offences, including throwing a Molotov cocktail and organising protests by text message. His family say he was tortured into confessing. Ali from the Riyadh, he asked him to talk to him and said that there is a law in the وفيها حد الحرابة علي طفل صغير سألني بابا إيش حد الحرابة علي سألني إيش حد الحرابة بابا The punishment for treason is beheading followed by being publicly crucified But some felt Ali was being punished because of this man. Sheikh Nima was Ali's uncle. He was seen as the spiritual leader of the protests. ما يغيب عن بالي على طول ذكر علي موجود في بالي على طول سامي الهج بالدعاء إليه بالفرج إليه أشياء كثيرة كثيرة في البيت تعني لي علي كل البيت أصلاً يعني لي علي. The British government says it has lobbied to spare Ali the death penalty, but in September 2015. Ali's death sentence was confirmed, with no more chance to appeal. In the same week, it was revealed Saudi Arabia was made the chair of a UN Human Rights Council panel of experts. Ensaf, the wife of Raif Badawi, the blogger sentenced to 1,000 lashes, is in Strasbourg to collect an award on his behalf. It's good for her campaign, but the review of Rafe's case in the Saudi courts has not gone well. 
رايف اتنقل الى سجن تاني السجن التاني هذا اللي نقل فيه ما يكون فيه الا اي الا شخص منتهي كان خبر جدا سيء انا قلقانه كثير على صحه رايف In response to his appeal being denied, she says Rafe has begun a hunger strike. المعاكس للموضوع رايف انه بعيد عن اولاده والحكم اللي صدر ضده كان حكم كثير قاسي In part 3 we uncover how internal Saudi ideology has been spread around the world. For more than 70 years, Saudi Arabia has been Britain and the West's key ally in the Arab world. The government says they've kept us safe by sharing intelligence and helping us fight terrorism and foil attacks. Oh, very, very nice to see you. Since David Cameron's government came to power, we've sold Saudi Arabia more than five billion pounds of weapons. Saudi Arabia has been a very important partner. We've got our oil from them, we've sold weapons technology to them, and they have been an ally in providing intelligence about low-level Al-Qaeda activities. But there's an irony there, and that is because actually Al-Qaeda stems from uh, an extreme interpretation of Wahhabi Salafism, which is the official religion of Saudi Arabia, uh, and which they've been spreading around the world since 1979. Um, so there's an ambivalence to that relationship. The Saudis have spent at least $70 billion spreading Wahhabi Islam around the world. But they've always denied any official link to terrorism and are now preparing to send troops into fight against ISIS in Syria. But evidence has come to light related to the most high-profile terror attack of all. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 were Saudi citizens. Osama bin Laden himself came from a prominent Saudi family. It prompted the United States to investigate Saudi links to terrorist organizations. There were individuals within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, some of them prominent citizens, some of them people with ties to the royal family, who were funneling funds to all kinds of activities we saw tremendous amounts of money were going to promote a Wahhabi variation of Sunni Islam. And that led to, I think, mostly unintended consequences, but they should have been recognizable consequences. According to US government documents we've obtained, a pattern emerged of Islamic charities supporting terrorism. The CIA reported that governments in the Islamic world had supported the charity's religious activities, but were unable to monitor them or how their money was used. The name of one charity came up repeatedly. The Saudi High Commission for Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was set up in Sarajevo by Saudi Arabia and provided more than 300 million pounds in aid for Bosnian Muslims. The Saudi High Commission uh, was a significant state-funded charity and it was tied in certain instances to financing terrorism, in particular in Bosnia, for example. There were people within this institution who were funneling funds to terrorist groups at the time. But more than allegations of passing on money, we found evidence the Saudi High Commission was providing employment and cover for terrorists. Inside this New York courthouse are boxes of evidence for a case brought by the families of 9-11 victims against the Saudi government and the Saudi High Commission. The families are currently appealing their case after it was dismissed last year on the grounds of sovereign immunity. 
Among the material is this tape, recorded testimony from a convicted Al-Qaeda terrorist. Uh, it's never before been broadcast. This is Ali Hamad, a jihadi who fought with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and Bosnia. He alleges he and others were employed by the Saudi High Commission and that local officials at the charity knew that he was linked to Al-Qaeda. He says Bosnia was seen as a crucial foothold in Europe for Al-Qaeda to plan future attacks. Hamad was later involved in setting off a car bomb in Bosnia in 1997 after the war had ended. It was apparently designed to kill non-Muslims and reignite the fighting there. Documents obtained by lawyers for the 9-11 families also reveal Washington knew about the charity's direct links to terror. But it was only after 9-11 that action was taken. NATO's heightened state of security. Two weeks after the 9-11 attacks, NATO special forces raided the charity's offices in Sarajevo. Are you saying that you have evidence of Al-Qaeda's activities here in Bosnia? Yes. We've spoken to another senior officer involved in the raid, who described the material they uncovered as very disturbing. A hard drive of maps of military buildings in Washington, information on how to fake State Department badges, and before and after pictures of the World Trade Center. The scope of the evidence, the number of people with terrorist connections who were affiliated with this organization, the amount of money that flowed out of it, undermines the notion that it was a purely legitimate humanitarian organization. There was certainly something else going on. Documents filed in court confirm that the Saudi High Commission was an official arm of its government, which provided a third of its funding. And that the charity's president throughout this period was a man whose face now hangs over the streets of Riyadh. At the time, Prince, now King Salman. And Saudi media reported he visited its offices in Sarajevo a year before it was raided. The Saudi High Commission was linked to radical individuals who, um, in several different instances, uh, were allegedly involved with Al-Qaeda. That suggests to me a questionable uh, sense of judgment about what the drivers of terrorism are or historically have been. King Salman could or should have done a better job in exerting oversight over the organizations in which he was chair. The Saudi government in the past has said that none of its agencies knowingly provided funds to Al-Qaeda or other terrorist groups. There is no suggestion King Salman, the royal family or senior Saudi officials knew about or were involved in the alleged support for terrorism at the Saudi High Commission. The 9-11 Commission said that although Saudi Arabia had long been considered the primary source of Al-Qaeda funding, it had found no evidence that the Saudi government or senior officials individually funded Al-Qaeda, but that this did not exclude the likelihood that charities with significant Saudi government sponsorship diverted funds to Al-Qaeda. Since 9-11, Saudi Arabia has wanted to show the world that they are tackling terrorism. They themselves have been the target of attacks, and they have passed laws to clamp down on private donations from inside the kingdom. They have carried out airstrikes against ISIS, and are now preparing for a ground war against them in Syria. They also deny Saudi Arabia supports ISIS ideologically. But many feel that it's the underlying Wahhabi ideology that's the wider problem. The ideology of ISIS is not much different from the ideology that Wahhabi Salafi Islam in Saudi Arabia adheres to. Unless the Saudis deal with this issue, we are going to constantly fight yesterday's war, and even if we defeat ISIS, there'll be another terrorist organization, perhaps with a different name, as long as they have this ideology that emanates from Saudi Arabia. I think our national interest uh, needs, to, needs to take into account the very real threat 
that the ideology that comes from there is is posing to us. And we see this in Daesh, we see it in ISIS, we see it in our domestic terrorism. And so I think that uh, morally we need to make a stand. I think that the, the chickens are coming home to roost on this one. King Salman's government says it's leading a crackdown on terrorism at home as well as abroad. They've led a coalition against an uprising by a Shia militia in neighboring Yemen, using British and American weaponry in a widespread bombing campaign. And on the 2nd of January, 2016, they announced the execution of 47 men for terrorist offenses in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia says it has executed 47 people. It was the largest mass execution since 1980. Shia cleric, Nimr al Whilst many were convicted Al-Qaeda terrorists, several others were political activists. Ali Nimr was spared for now, but his uncle, the Shia cleric Sheikh Nimr, was executed. This new footage, smuggled out by Yasser's network in the last few weeks, shows how his execution has sparked the first major protests in the East since the Arab Spring. I mean, the execution of Sheikh Namir is a, a signal that the Saudis were sending not to the Shia only, but to all dissidents, secular and Islamic. They will not tolerate any dissent because they are viscerally opposed to sharing power. The executions have clearly had an effect on the activists we've been filming. Yasser has now been working undercover for six months, every day risking arrest. But he tells us that after the executions, the situation has become too risky to continue. James, where you come the elections, billed as a great advance for women's rights, went ahead. But women's activist Lujain Hathloul was missing from the ballot. Unfortunately, the religious establishment is not really aligned with any of the uh, economic, uh, social, or best interests of the 30 million people living in Saudi Arabia. Their needs and best interests and voices should be heard, and it will continue to be an issue for the people and for the political system until it's resolved. It's not going to go away because people are being imprisoned or even executed. A year since Raif Badawi was publicly flogged, he's still serving out his 10-year sentence. His wife, Ensaf, hasn't heard from him since the executions happened. كل الأخبار اللي نسمعها ما أحب أحكي عنها عشان ما ما يجي خلط في راسي فما أحب إني أحكي عنها أحب إنه دائما أنا مقتنعة قناعة تامة عن إنه كل اللي قاعد يصير مختلف عن قضية رايف تماما In response to the film, the Foreign Office told us. Only by working with Saudi Arabia can we bring about changes we would like to see. We regularly raise with them the importance of compliance with international law, including in the Yemen conflict. 
Senior Saudi leaders have condemned sectarianism and ISIS's ideology. Our police training undergoes strict assessment and is designed to improve human rights compliance of the Saudi justice system. Our arms sales are subject to one of the most robust export control regimes in the world. We are extremely concerned about Raif Badawi and have raised his case at very senior levels. The Saudi government has assured us that Ali Nimr will not be executed. The Saudi government told us. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia utterly rejects the partisan nature and sensationalist tone of this documentary, which sets out to portray the country in a negative and unbalanced light. The Kingdom's legal system is based on the due process of Islamic Sharia law. The Kingdom is at the forefront of international efforts to combat terrorism and will pursue anyone who supports and funds terrorist activity, and to suggest otherwise is a slur. In keeping with its biased agenda, ITV chose to undertake covert filming when they could have applied for and received a journalistic visa, like many of their counterparts. Activists say they're being forced underground, but with the spread of phones and cameras, it has become impossible for the regime to control what the world sees. <laughs>